And on this stream, we're going to continue where we left off with day 11, basically the last two networking challenges. Then we've got two special challenges, I guess. I don't know what those are going to entail. One of these doesn't have a box to deploy, so that's interesting. And then uh, the most recent two are both scripting challenges. So if we do real well, um, or I, I just want to go for a longer stream, we might end up getting into the scripting ones. But at, at the very least, I'm hoping to get through the networking ones. Um, they were only taking maybe about half an hour each on the last stream, so should definitely be able to get through those, and, and then we'll find out what's in the special ones. All right. The Day 11 Challenge, The Rogue Gnome. The prelude says... This is it, the moment that Elf McEager has been waiting for. It's the final exam of the NMAP course that he enlisted on during day eight, What's Under the Christmas Tree. It looks like all the hard work of hitting the books has paid off. Success, Elf McEager screams. The exploit worked, yippee. Elf McEager has successfully managed to create a reverse shell from the target back to his computer. Little did he know, the real exam begins now. The last stage of the exam requires Elf McEager to escalate his privileges. He spent so much time studying NMAP cheat sheets that now he's drawing a blank. Can you help Elf, McE Elf McEager? To be the good guy, sometimes you gotta be the bad guy first. All right, so we're gonna do some privesque, uh, I guess on Windows, just based on this screenshot. Um, today's learning objectives. We're going to be learning the fundamentals uh, privilege escalation, what it entails, and how it is used day to day without you even realizing in legitimate circumstances. After covering the fundamentals of Linux file permissions and understanding why we may want to escalate our privileges as a pen tester, we're going to put our theory into practice by abusing common file permission misconfiguration on Linux. A common file permission misconfiguration. Cool. And as with all the other networking ones, this uh, this day's challenge is by CMnatic. So thanks again, CMnatic. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, privilege escalation is a core legitimate part of how operating systems work when they have multiple layers of authority or, or you know, uh, security boundaries around what certain accounts or uh, modes of certain accounts can do. And, you know, if you need to be an administrator to perform certain actions, then it sort of is a, a necessary element of that is the ability to be an administrator. And usually it's a, a better experience to not require logging in completely separate from whatever existing session in order to assume those administrator privileges because a that that's you know more time spent going through that it might be just more of a friction uh to to go and then log in as a second account if you had a bunch of programs running you've got stuff going on um and and those sessions are going to be completely separate uh and as a result of that friction, you know, you, you're sort of, because people are, you know, the way people work is they're going to spend the lowest amount of effort they can to achieve their goals. That's, I mean, you know, I don't know, you could call that like conservation of <laughs> momentum or something. I forget what the, uh, the like laws of physics way of thinking about it might be but uh oh i need to deploy this box but the the point is like if you need to be logged in separately as an administrator to do any administrative tasks the result is you're going to have people that log in as an administrator the entire time because then they've reduced the friction of switching into that mode and they can still do all the other stuff anyways because uh generally speaking administrator access whatever that is that higher level of access um, is a superset of all the stuff that a normal user could do. So they aren't they aren't restricting themselves in any way by just logging in. In the case of Linux, by logging in as root every time. So 
rather than encourage people to log in as root in order to save themselves some hassle whenever they need to then perform a task that only root can do, uh, you should give them a tool that allows them to temporarily assume the capabilities of root, right? And so then I call it sudo, super user do, whatever, sudo, sudo, I don't know. Um, that's the standard thing on Unix, Linux systems. Uh, and then there's what they showed up at the top for Windows, um, user account control is the Windows equivalent. And you can do that from an account that's an administrator already, but they have these two sort of uh, modes that those accounts work in. There's administrator and then there's like for real administrator basically. And you can use the user account control to acquire those additional privileges without even presenting a password um, because the Microsoft doesn't consider that a security boundary. Or if you're logged in as a separate user, then you can present the credentials of an administrator account as well. And that's more traditionally what you think of as sudo. I mean, I guess sudo, because you can configure it any way you want, I could set up commands that my user account, either the named account or the groups that I'm in, uh, have access to use without presenting a password, in which case it's maybe equivalent to that uh, user account control from administrator style that Microsoft has. Um, they're both pretty flexible systems, I guess, but they, they have sort of different defaults into how they work. But the goal is the same either way, right? You want to acquire administrative permissions for a limited time period or a limited task. And that way you can run most of the time not with those permissions because that is a better security, uh, I don't know, stance, let's say. All right, so as with all the other ones, we're gonna just sort of switch, move past this stuff for now, um, all the explanation stuff, and we might come back to it if we need to for the purposes you know, if, if I am stuck on something, I'll maybe read some of that. But ideally, I can get through this stuff without it. Um, so, yeah, the challenges or the, the, the description of the challenge. Uh, ensure that you have deployed the instance attached to this task and take note of the IP address. Answer question number one and number two before proceeding to log into the vulnerable instance. You have already been provided with the credentials to use to log into the vulnerable instance in question number three. All right, so we don't have to actually do the Nmap stuff that was described in the prelude. Um, this is a purely privesque situation. We've assumed our, some process has been taken to gain access. Maybe, I mean, in the real world, this might have been some combination of social engineering or, you know, otherwise acquiring legit credentials, but it could also have been... Um, effectively a remote code execution kind of vulnerability that was exploited in order to establish a surreptitious um, access as a service account of some sort uh, through, you know, reverse shell potentially. There's variations on that, but whatever it is, we've got access to some account that is not fully given full permissions. And so now we want to get those full permissions. All right, we're going to apply your newly found knowledge from this task to escalate your privileges. Study the hints carefully if needed. Everything to complete this day has been discussed throughout today's task. Excellent. So we can just refer back to that if we need to. Um, and then if you want to hone in your skills, you can check out the new privilege escalation and shells module. Excellent. Um, and then modules, they say modules provide a guided style of learning for all users similar to subscriber pathways. Okay, just real quick before we get into it, I'm curious, because I've seen the pathways stuff and I went through almost everything in the like sort of pen testing pathway. I think there might be a box or two that I still need to work on in there, uh, but I'd have to resubscribe for that, it sounds like. I forgot, um, but I guess, or offensive pen testing. Um, yeah, I don't, I can't even see it right now, I guess. 
because it's going to say I need to subscribe or has, have I lost my, okay. I can't see these. I think I just had maybe some stuff in extra credit or maybe I don't remember a category called active directory. So maybe they've switched it around. Um, but in any case, I don't have access to it until I resubscribe. So give that a shot maybe another time. Um, but these modules are also interesting. Um, yeah, I could actually probably do the cryptography one. Cryptography has been one of my not, um, like one of my least uh, practice skills, let's say. I almost never do these kinds of challenges in um, CTF stuff. Uh, it's just, I don't know, the math <laughs> doesn't really, I'm just not that great at it. I've done a few, but it's always been with significant help from friends of mine that are definitely way more competent in their math skills. Um, so maybe after Advent of Code, we can come back and look at some of these, but they look like they're probably covering stuff that I don't need to practice. Um, this one and, and basic computer exploitation may be a good idea. Um, because I, I can always do more. I haven't done like tons of work with Privesk. Um, oh yeah, I was looking at this one already. I think I have gone through all of these. I know I did Steel Mountain because it was part of the offensive pen testing one. Um, and I'm pretty sure I've done, yeah, I've done Kenobi. Um, the other ones might not be ones that I've done yet. Um, I guess I did Volnversa. Volnversity, um, but I haven't done basic pen testing, which, I mean, my expectation is that I'm, I'm not going to learn anything if I do this room, but, you know, might be might be a fun one to check out real quick. Okay, so that's enough uh, dodging the actual challenges. Let's go ahead and get started. What type of privilege escalation involves using a user account to execute commands as an administrator? Um, yeah, I wonder what their terminology for this is. I'm, I'm certain that if I just go up and look at the documentation, it'll be right there. Uh, pseudoers, it's gonna be the, the file there. Um, Yeah, I'm sure there's a. I'm sure that the term that they're using will make perfect sense to me, but I, it's not coming to me right now, and I don't think there's any reason for me to like sit around and and try to imagine what it could be. Um, oh, okay, Hor horizontal versus vertical. So, using a user account to execute commands as an administrator is going to be vertical because in this sort of intuitive way of mapping that to a 2D space, so to speak, going upwards means more privilege versus going sideways means equivalent levels of privilege, but different accounts, which, you know, can also be useful. If you can't go up, if you can go sideways, you might still get access to more interesting data or services that you could then use to pivot into another machine or something. Like there's definitely value to going horizontal in some cases. It's, but I would say in like general, it's probably less valuable than going up. Um, depends on how far up you can go, I guess, or exactly how the machine is configured. All right, so now uh, use SSH to log in to the vulnerable machine. Okay, and it's gonna be AOC 2020. I guess we'll just trust that fingerprint. It's on the VPN, so I feel okay with that. Um, okay, so that means we logged in. And then enumerate the machine for executables that have had the SUID permission set. Look at the output and mixture of GTFO bins 
and use look at the output and use a mixture of GTFO bins and your researching skills to learn how to exploit this binary. Okay, so um, I shouldn't be doing this in, I'm gonna look at the manual page uh, on my machine. It's probably the same as what they have on their machine or very similar. Um, but I, rather than use um, something that's a little um, excessive or, or just like a very broad tool like uh, LinPs, which is my usual go-to in these uh, TriHackMe rooms, um, we can just use the, we can just set up the find command directly. Um, okay. So we want to find slash and perm 4000 uh, type F and let's do that. All right, so bash, is that usually set UID? Maybe, maybe, I feel like that isn't. Um, mount, unmount, yeah, S, su, or like super user, obviously, ping usually needs to be. Um, are all things in the snap so it's probably not that helpful um chain shell maybe although that's probably changing it in etsy password so that needs to be uh which we'll call it needs to be set uid so that i can access that file but isn't necessarily uh inherently vulnerable um bash is probably the one that i'm most interested in um yeah it's owned by root and it's set uid so that's surprising is it only set uid if you are root because it's s on here or does it always put the s there and not replace these executes um Okay, so we are CMnatic, and if we just run bin bash, we're still CMnatic. Okay, so to what, ex to what end is that set UID? So I think if I look at like bash on my system, it's not set UID. Um, well, let's look at GTFO bins and see if they say there's any, like, I would have thought if I just run it, um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I always forget. I do this. I ran into the same thing when I was trying to do an exploit that was running bash, uh, as part of the shell code and the binary that was that I was exploiting was set UID bash wasn't, but when I was running bash through the shell code, it was not actually getting the permissions. And that's because you need to say dash P otherwise bash will by default drop those permissions down to the, uh, it won't give you the effective user ID. It'll get the real user ID. So, my effective user ID is root. So there we go. All right. Um, and this one looks like it's maybe an auto generated answer. So I, I appreciate that because so many of the flags on the boxes on TriacMe are static ones. And then that allows folks, it doesn't particularly matter. Um, for these like training rooms but then if you do the like king of the hill stuff um it can be kind of annoying when people can just 
save those flags and punch them in to get points right away without having to actually do any of the work. Um, okay. Cool. So that's all we needed. Um, there we go. I need to remember the dash P on uh, bin bash for the future. Okay. It's the same one. Ready, set, elf. All right. Day 12, ready, set, elf. The prelude reads, Christmas is fast approaching, yet all remain silent at the best festival company. What gives? The cheek of those elves, slacking at the festival period. Santa has no time for slackers in his workshop. After all, the sleigh won't fill itself, nor will the good and naughty lists be sorted. Santa has tasked you, Elf McGeeger, with whacking those elves back in line. Okay. Uh, today's learning objectives. I'm going to hit deploy, or I'm going to terminate the old one, and then hit deploy. We're going to be applying some of the skills and techniques we previously explored in this year's Advent of Cyber. Let's put on our enumeration caps, crack our knuckles, and get hands-on with learning about discovering and exploiting an interesting fu functionality of web servers. So maybe this one is a little like the culmination of the network series. And I would say the network series is even more organized as a learning experience tutorial than the web exploitation ones, which are like, they're all definitely about learning a specific skill in web exploitation. Um, but I think the way that the, um, these ones have been written uh, in the networking, partly because it's all by the same person. Again, it's by CMnatic. They they have a consistency to them that really helps for the learning process, and they're they're very explicit about what the learning goals are, the learning objectives. So they feel more directly like a what you would want in a classroom curriculum around network security stuff. So I really appreciate that. And it makes sense maybe that you would have, you know, build up these, try these different things individually, and then let's try combining them. That's what I'm guessing just from the objectives. They do talk about like, maybe they're gonna introduce a new vulnerability, like uh, functionality that we can exploit in web servers. Um, but, you know, most likely we're probably going to be also applying some of these other skills in something that's a more equivalent to a full pen test scenario um, and, and more equivalent to some of the rooms in Try Hack Me that really try to simulate the, the pen test experience or, or the equivalent of maybe um, some of the boxes that you would find in the uh, OSCP because there you're just given a box you're not given any like hints around where to go about it so you got to start with enumeration and you got to start with uh investigating at, at the edges before finding a way to get some access some foothold on and then maybe you privesque um so it's usually that sequence of like three or four separate stages um okay so let's see if uh, challenge time. Okay. To solve Elf McSkitty's problem with the elves slacking in the workshop, he has created the CGI script elfwhacker.bat. Deploy the instance attached to this task. Use your nmap skills to find out what port the machine, the web server is running on. Visit the application and discover the installation version. Weaponize this information by searching knowledge bases for exploits and interpreter payloads possible and whack those elves. Cool. So yeah, we're basically, I mean, they give us a hint that we should start with nmap scanning it, um, which is almost always a good, good path to go down. So let's follow that hint. Um, set up the box and um, yeah, why not? 
So we get 80, 80. Uh, and let's think it's, or is it VS? Maybe it's S capital V. Oh, and I probably can just say like that. Um, just do those ports. I don't know why I said zero. There's no, I don't think there's a port zero. Oh, and that's not gonna hit. Okay. Um, so just dash dash top ports, okay. Be there okay because I know if I do dash p dash it's not actually gonna end and I I would like to just have it find reasonable ones and then scan them for uh, information about like do the fingerprinting of the services rather than keep searching for potentially something running on a weird port All right, so we have uh, at least two web servers. I don't know what JServe is. It feels like it probably works on top of HTTP. Just, I mean, it's a Apache project. Um, so in that sense, it probably works as a web server. Uh, it's a binary protocol, so actually it's not HTTP. Um, Interesting. Why would this be visible? Like the way this description of it, the Apache JSERV protocol is a binary protocol that can be, oh, apologies for that. Um, if you all heard it, I don't, I guess I'm not playing my desktop audio. So you probably didn't hear the phone call noise. Um, the Apache JSERV protocol is a binary protocol that can be that can proxy inbound requests from a web server through an application server that sits behind the web server. So I guess okay, in this way maybe it's acting as its own is a sort of nmap or sorry, uh Nginx kind of you know, like which you would usually sit in front of a web server that is the application web server um but it uses its own binary protocol um but i would this feels like a thing that you would put between nginx and your actual application or something and maybe i don't know um i'm surprised that it's directly accessible by outside machines in theory you know the way that this is being simulated would be machines on the internet basically um but that's fine uh so then we've got an HTTP API server. Um, don't know what that's about. Uh, curious. Um, Network discovery, huh? Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, there, you know, there might be vulnerabilities there, but they're clearly asking about the version for the web server, which we got with the Tomcat web server. So we can just throw that in for the answer. So maybe that's the path that they're thinking we should go in. Um, okay, so I believe we have search exploit. Tomcat, I think we can just paste that in. Uh, oh, okay, I haven't actually been reading the error messages. Hmm. Let's 
So there's something. Curious. Okay. What's wrong with any of that? Oops. Right. Files, exploits, files, shell codes. Uh, oh, the path array is wrong. Okay. This is something that maybe needs to be fixed in the package build. User share exploit db. Um, oops. Let's see if that works better. Okay. At least we don't get the error messages. But. All right. So we have Apache Tomcat. Um, maybe I need to update or something. I got nine zero seventeen. Um, I guess it's the mod JK, which they said JSERV was. My recollection was that that's what that said. Um, says runs in Pachi with mod JK. Um, oh, okay. Um, yeah, I don't know the details of Chase Serve and how that connects into Tomcat. I'm not that up on the whole Java spectrum of web technology. Um, but maybe we can try this guy this is a metasploit uh, thing so maybe it's in there um, yeah let's give that a shot so it's got all these but they're for rather old versions um, Just continuing to look through to see if there's anything. All right, so let's give this one a shot. Um, projects, try hack new room, AFC. All right, and then we want to use Tomcat, and it'll just tell us what options we have for Tomcat. Hmm. I wonder if it's this one is just not included. Um, I 
anything that mentions mod JK? Okay, here's the one that I was looking at, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. All right, and it already chose the payload that we want, I think. So, set our hosts. I probably can't do this, but we can give it a shot, I suppose. And then, Oh, you know what? Target's not even going to be set in this session, so even if that would work. Um, is it THM local? Mm. Yeah, second. What did I call it? Oh, you know what? I probably just didn't. Okay, never mind. Thought I had a bash alias that I use for setting up the TriHackMe VPN. I thought I had it set the local IP on the VPN for me as well, but I did not. So just going to go ahead and copy that so I don't remember it. Um, in case I need it later. Okay. So we can go ahead and give it a shot, I guess. Uh, oh yeah, set our hosts, uh, our port rather, to scroll up to our nmap settings. Um, do we want 8080? Or do we need 8009? All right, let's try it with 8009. No, okay. Um, so maybe my theory of that being a usable thing is incorrect. I guess it is technically listed as protocol version 1.3. I don't know if that lines up to the version of mod JK. Um, I guess I also don't know if it is running, uh, my JK at all in, in the first place. Um, we can try some other Tomcat ones, I guess. Um, oh, these are, these require you to be authenticated. So that's not necessarily going to help at all. Um, we can just try going to the target and see what we got here. Um, what do we have on zero nine? It's probably since it's supposed to be a binary protocol, right? Oh yeah. That's probably why we got EOF. Cause it's not, it's not going to respond on HTTP. Uh, if we send it an HTTP request, um, what are the situations? Okay, so we don't have access to the manager. And then this, I assume, is like your default page. Server status, also don't have access because that's in the manager. 
I'm going to presume... Oh, we got a 404 on host manager. Okay. Um, so let's look on exploit DB directly. See if we find anything um, more recent, maybe. I mean, we can try this one, I guess. Does it say, does it explain? Doesn't really, we can find the CVE. Oh, and it wants us to find a CVE number, I recall. Okay. Um... I mean, it, I don't think that this one would be 900M1 to 900, but we're on 9017. But, you know, I might as well try it. Um, and, oh, didn't they mention something about CGI? Yeah. Can we go to slash CGI bin? It's called elfwhacker.bat. There we go. Okay, so that's, let's see. Okay. Number goes up surprisingly quickly. Um, cool. So maybe it's this one. CGI servlet. Um, so the vulnerability is in Tomcat CGI servlet component. When the enable command line arguments setting is set to true, a remote user can abuse this to execute system commands. So they're not like checking. Um, servlet specifications. This is just documentation. Okay. Um, trying to see if we can get like configuration details. These are still in the docs. So I think it would tell me if we have the servlet installed. Um, but I don't know. We can just give it a shot in Metasploit. Um, do we have the CGI? Here we go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Should have put use. Okay. Um, Let's set our host again. And might need to set the virtual host. I don't know. We need to set L host. Um Can I turn off the check?
should I do? I don't know. That's probably not how to do it. So. Oh, it is. Okay. Um. Is this actually working? It's very slow to send the stage. For... Yeah, I didn't think. Okay. Huh. So it could be. Um. The upload bypass, that's got a CVE on it. This one's got a CVE as well, so. Um, what is the check, basically? Oh, okay. Um, Set target URI slash CGI bin slash elf whacker dot map, maybe. Okay. Now it says target is vulnerable actually. So what I was looking at there we go. Um, so I was looking at the check code, right? Which is how it was determining that it's not vulnerable. And I saw that it was appending, um, you know, basically the echo command. And the way that this exploit works is it says, if you have this setting configured on the server, then you can basically provide additional stuff. And in this case, the additional stuff is question mark echo, I guess. So the question mark says to you know run the command that was the original thing for the CGI, um, and then as a second command because it's just like bash syntax or or maybe shell syntax in general, um, run the echo command. And if we actually see the echo response, then we yeah if it includes that signature that we generated. Um, then we knew that the echo ran. So, but it was needing to append this uh, query string to the target URI. And we had left it as slash, which is not the CGI bin script. So we needed to actually tell it which script to try to use. Um, okay, who am I maybe? What? Okay, whatever. So we know that this is the CVE Pritcher that we need to use. That's not the right answer. Oh, I need to put CVE first. Okay. Cool. Um, okay, so we have our interpreter in there, and then we need to find um, Can I say cat? Can I just type it? Okay. All right, so that's flag one. I assume maybe we need to do a privesk from here. Uh, or, oh, I guess we don't need to. Okay. Um, but we could, we could attempt to find uh, privesk. Um, I think what I would do at this point is upload a uh, upload maybe WinPs because um, the equivalent process for finding some of the low hanging fruit in the same way that like finding set UID binaries that are exploitable um, is a little more involved uh, on Windows. I guess what I could do is find that chunk of the WinP script, um, the bat version at least. 
And the, the thing that I'm looking for, because I've seen it on several different rooms in the in Trihackme, is services that are installed without quoting the path, and then they have a space in the path, and the lookup process results in you can uh, unquoted service paths here. Okay, so see, it's kind of a annoying amount of <laughs> patch script to get those results, but might as well give it a shot. Um, can we do it this way? Let's try that. Um, and yeah, then you could put your own binary uh, in there. All right, so they have given us one of these, the Elf Whacker. So um, how do I view directory permissions? <laughs> This is, you know, I'm not that, oh yeah, I, I see ACLs. Okay. Let's see. Um, is that... Oh, I need to not have the slash at the end, I guess. All right. Um, so this is our user account, right? We are TBFC Web01 Elf McSkitty. Uh, so we have full permissions to TBFC apps directory. So we can uh, put something in this directory called elf, basically elf.exe, and that will be run if we say to run the elf whacker. Uh, what should we call it? The Elf Whacker service. Wow, what has happened over here? <laughs> okay. Um, so this is day. So let's just do this real quick. Day twelve. All right, and then we want to run MSF Venom, uh, list payloads, Windows. All right, and there might be a way inside of Meterpreter to say just upload this particular payload. Um, Oh, I don't know if it's x64, so let's not do x64. Um, so let's just do this payload. I always forget the, we want to say, yeah. And then lhost equals thm local our host equals, I guess we don't need to say our host. L, uh, L port is gonna be equal to 4445. It's an executable and we'll just call it uh, elf.exe. CD uh, 
Right, okay, so now upload day 12. All right. Um, I forget what the session, like, pause, switch to a different session is. Um, background. All right, so now we want to say use multi, multi, something multi, right? Why can I never remember this? Um, is it in here? Find it from this search. No, I think we did the reverse. It was this one. So yeah, multi slash handler. Where's exploit slash multi slash handler? Okay. <laughs> And then set payload to that at L port. All right, so we'll use this, or we'll run it rather. Um, And then sessions. Uh, how do I run it in the background? Basically what I would like to do is not have to run multiple MSF console instances. Can force an active module to the background by passing dash J. Oh, I guess that's the, okay. So we could say exploit dash J, and then we've also got that other session. Um, okay, so I think. We have jobs? Yeah, cool. Okay, so then what do I need to do? Sessions. Dash I one. So then, we do like Windows start service, I don't remember. Yeah, PowerShell. Um, there's a program for it and I forget what it's called. Net start.
Wolf Whacker, I think it was. Hit stop, Elf Whacker. I guess we could have done restart. Background. Then it died. Why did it die? So now, um, sessions. So let's just run it as like I don't need to interact with it. Um, can I do this? Use dash s. Oh, that's a okay for a script. Um, say like. Hmm, why, oh, is there no restart? Okay. There we go. So we have a, a system shell now on this session. So, I mean, I don't think there's any other flags. And for whatever reason, it dies pretty quickly. I'm assuming the service configuration results in it uh, being detected as not having started or something like that. So that's unfortunate. But in theory, right, we have access, like the timing issue is either something that we could fix by reconfiguring how the service works potentially, or we can sort of live with that because, you know, I can write a script to do all the stuff that I need to do. And then I can tell it to run that script in the context of our, um, admin shell or system shell, uh, and, and not really be hindered very much by the time constraint. And maybe that, script would be the thing to reconfigure the service um but okay so we were able to escalate privileges on that box so feel pretty good about that we can go ahead and just terminate it all right day 13 coal for christmas is a special room by John Hammond. Uh, prove these sysadmins deserve coal for Christmas. So let's go ahead and deploy that room. Um, I'll pop out of interpreter. I don't know if we need it anymore. And we can leave the box to find it as it is. We'll override it when we know the new IP. Hi Santa, hop in your sleigh and deploy this machine. All right, we did click that button. 
the Christmas GPS now says this house is at the address to be filled in later. Scan this machine with a port scanning tool of your choice. Okay, they say of your choice, but they do tell you to use Nmap, or at least suggest it. So we'll get to that when we have a machine that we can reach. And I feel like even though it's gonna be available in 30 seconds, these boxes take a little while to boot up, so we we may still need to wait as, as well. Um, and then there's a service that we could attempt to connect to sort of with a pure plain text thing, like maybe use Netcat, maybe use Telnet. Telnet's not exactly plain text, it uses some control characters, but it's mostly type stuff in and then you get the that raw text gets sent over. We might just use uh, Netcat. And I mean, we can start on it. Oh, this one started up pretty good. So we do have 23, which I believe is Telnet. So maybe we can just pop in there. Um, but I'll wait for the scan to finish and then it's going to attempt to fingerprint those services. And then we might want to en enumerate some stuff on that box. Um, and it looks like we could use Dirty Cow to do a kernel based exploit. It's kind of an old one. It's an old code, but it checks out, sir. I don't know, now I'm the fucking dude that does the reference to Star Wars. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll get to this in a second when the map finishes. Okay, so we got our Telnet on 23, we got our SSH on 22, we got an RPC service, I guess. Um, so cool, and it's running Ubuntu some version. So, no, it's not target IP, it's just target. All right. Um, Oh, and it tells us how to log in. That's great. Hi, Santa. We knew you were coming, and we wanted to make it easy to drop off presents, so we created an account for you to use. Santa and Claus Christmas is the password. We left you cookies and milk. Excellent. So, Santa, Claus Christmas. There we go. We get a little Christmas tree. And we are the Santa user. And Ooh, we got a whole file of C code. Haha, <laughs> too bad, Santa. I, the Grinch, got here before you did. I helped myself to some of the goodies here. Bet you can still enjoy some half eaten cookies and this leftover milk. But you can enjoy, sorry. Uh, why don't you try and refill it yourself? Yours truly, the Grinch. Okay, so let's see what we're doing in this program. So I'm gonna just scroll on down to main and we're gonna copy a file or we're gonna run the function copy file. I'm assuming it's named, you know, not in a way to be uh, obfuscated. It's not, it's not tricking me by calling it copy file, so I think it's probably what it's trying to do. And then we've got a user info struct that was defined up there. Username is Grinch. Set the user ID to zero and the group ID to zero, so that would make them root, I suppose. Uh, info is pwned, okay. And then they have root as their home directory, sure, and bin bash, okay. So the copy file we we run access um and okay so we're attempting to back up etsy password essentially and we're using f open to read from that file and to read from etsy password and f open to write to temp password dot back um, and as long as, you know, we get one character at a time 
and we print it. Um, okay. And then where does the M advise come in? I think this is possibly gets called by, why is this returning a void pointer, but there's no actual return from the function? Um, I don't know. And what is the, where's the map? Here we go. Here's our map pointer. So it's possible that this gets called by some code um, that is used in libc when we are doing this file copy stuff. Because we aren't actually writing any of that stuff. Um, and maybe it's just giving us the pieces. Um, looks like we just have the same comment at the beginning as at the end. Uh, but my recollection, so dirty cow, because we did see that as we were scrolling through here. Um, the cow is uh, from the acronym for copy on write. And basically, it's an optimization that gets done, uh, in this case, in the kernel, where if you create a copy of some data, rather than actually writing a copy of that data to memory, which would be, I mean, it, it's not, it's only slow depending on the scale of the data that you're copying, but it's definitely slower than not copying any of the data at all. And so what they do is the optimization is they don't copy any of the data and only when that data is supposed to change. So if you write to the new copy, let's say you have 100 bytes of data and you copy it and then it doesn't actually do any copy. So when you read from that 100 bytes of data, it reads from the original because nothing has changed, so there's no reason not to use the original. Now, either something writes to the copy or something writes to the original. Now they are different. At that point, so if you write the first 10 bytes to be something different in either the original or the copy, that's when you actually get that portion of the data copied to a new area. And so you've got a copy of the first 10 bytes and then the modification happens from the right. And your read will still read from the original for the other 90 bytes and read from your copy for the first 10 bytes. Um, it's not it's not like it uses pages rather than arbitrary numbers of bytes and stuff, but that's the idea is you minimize how many how often you need to actually copy data because it really only needs to be copied if it's going to be different in one version than the other. Uh, so I believe the idea then something about how that process works, um, is being tricked potentially by M advised. Maybe this is simply required to ensure that the, the exploit runs reliably, but we're doing M advised don't need, which is saying like, we don't need to keep this portion of um, I don't know, 100 bytes, I guess, uh, for the address that it, the data that has been mapped to this address. Um, we're telling, we're trying to tell the kernel, like, we don't actually need this. So if you want to swap that out, um, feel free. And so I don't know where map actually gets written to. Um, basically it feels like this is a little bit incomplete unless I am like skimmed over something. 
Um, we aren't actually running generate password line and generate password hash where we the hash isn't being set by user info so we would need to call generate password hash with the the plain text of the password and then at some point we could call generate password line which generates the text to put into uh, the Etsy password file for a given user infrastructure and I think then that information would be we'd write it to somewhere in memory as you can see we've malloced uh, an amount of memory to store that string and then we return the pointer uh, after we've written the string into that portion of memory so we have allocated some memory on the heap and maybe in theory we am advised that we don't need that and as a result I think we're doing it two million times or something because maybe there's a bit of a race condition and we're just trying to like hammer that happening uh, it gets to it gets into a mode where it thinks this data is the original from Etsy password and we can just flush it out to disk so it ends up writing it to Etsy password because it thinks we mapped in the file um, and and it's just like oh okay this needs to be written out to disk and it thinks that's not our copy but the original data so it instead of writing it to password.back it writes it to Etsy password that's my vague guess from my vague understanding of dirty cow and what I've read in this file. But again, it's not complete enough for this code to, I think, be successful in uh, actually exploiting anything. Um, so let's look at that other file. Let's just cat it. Okay, so this prints a tree, I suppose. We can go ahead and run it, I guess. Is it this tree? Maybe. Ooh. Oh yeah. Um, I have that fixed for, oh, there we go. That's a very cute animation. Good work, John Hammond. Can I hit Q, control C to quit out of it? Okay. Um, I have my terminal configuration fixed for SSH through an alias, but I, I don't have it for Telnet because I, why would I use Telnet <laughs> uh, except for this challenge? Okay, so um, do we have to just give the password? Okay. All right, so we got onto the machine. Um, looks like you can slide down, right down the chimney. Log in and take a look around, enumerate a bit. You can view files and folders in the current directory with ls, change directories with cd, and view the contents of files with cat. Often to enumerate, you want to look at pertinent system information, like the version of the operating system or other release information. You can view some information with commands like this. Yeah, so my usual go-to is uname a and we're on way back in the day 3.2 kernel um it thinks it is 2012 um like the or is oh no this is when the it was compiled right if i just say date it does know that it's 2020 okay so yeah this 3.2 kernel um for ubuntu is from 2012 and probably um do cat etsy slash release star no what was the star release okay
What is the file? Oh, LSB. That's right. LSB release. Um, okay. So, yeah, it's on Ubuntu 12.04. Makes sense then that that's the kernel that we have. And we can go find some other Privesk stuff. There's also Etsy issue. Uh, okay. So that's how they did the MOTD for the Telnet. I guess we just <laughs> set that text into Etsy issue rather than, I don't know if there's a like an MOTD thing that actually is, because you can just set an MOTD for SSH, I think, in a, through some mechanism. I don't know. Um, so it's Ubuntu 12.04. This is a very old version of Linux. Yeah. This may be vulnerable to some kernel exploits that we could use to escalate our privileges. Take a look at the milk. Take a look at the cookies and milk that the server owners left for you. You can do this with the cat command as mentioned earlier. Okay, who got there uh, first? It was Grinch. Um, the perpetrator took half of the cookies and milk. I see. So that's what they were... That's what the message was talking about. Um, basically, the code is incomplete because the Grinch took some of the code. You'd think that the Grinch would use the code to get kernel control and install um, a rootkit or something, but I guess his, his plan is to just foil us from doing that. I don't know. Uh, okay, that C source code is a portion of a kernel exploit called Dirty Cow, um, which is from CB 2016-5195. And it's a privilege escalation vulnerability in the Linux kernel taking advantage of a race condition that was found in the way the Linux kernel's memory subsystem handled the copy on write breakage of private read-only memory mappings. An unprivileged local user could use this flaw to gain write access to otherwise read-only memory mappings and thus increase their privileges on the system. So that feels like it matches up with um, what I was talking about before in my, my guess as to how that exploit was working. Um, but really should... Uh, it was fixed in 2016. Oh, the, yeah, yeah, because it said the CV is 2016. Okay. Um, so, okay. And I remember this is like one of the earlier ones that is like an exploit that got a fancy website and name for it. Um, am I affected by the bug? Yes. Well, at the time, uh, hopefully you are not. Um, hopefully you are not affected by it at this point. So let's see if. Red Hat. Okay. Um. Guess we can look at the POCs. Wonder which of these POCs we had portions of the code for. I mean, they're gonna all kind of work the same, right? So, okay, it's doing the mAdvise stuff. So, yeah, we have to race mAdvise. Don't need, basically. Um. So, do they, they don't necessarily, I mean, I think this would be a fun one to write an exploit for, but I'm probably not going to take the time to try to do it right now. Sewage-based route. 
Um, Etsy password. So it's it's probably one of these ones. Yeah, it's this one. Okay, so let's see what we are missing. They basically took this stuff, I guess. Okay, so let's read through this and then we'll, we can copy it in, perhaps. I don't know what my shell situation is through the telnet, but I could, we could probably run vim and copy it in. Um, okay, so we need to provide a password uh, as the argument and then, or we can skip it and it will ask us to, it'll prompt us for the password, that's fine. Then we generate the hash for the password fill that into the user struct um, and we will, that'll have the username Grinch instead of Firefart in this case uh, and cool so it'll, it'll tell us what the, what the line that it's going to add is then we open the file we mmap that file as private in read only because we can only read it and then we fork okay and we put the password line into the mapped data okay um, we do that for a what, what, all right, let's see, thousand divided by the length of the line, or 10,000 rather. I'm, I'm trying to figure out why we are using these triply nested for loops. I'm guessing that the 10,000, is it 10,000 attempts? 10,000 times we are walking through this uh, in so for each character in the line we are attempting to poke it into the map 10,000 times maybe that's because it needs to race against the M advise thread basically so we like we keep rewriting the line into the file i guess um okay uh and then you know hopefully it works basically i mean with something like this it's, it's not a guaranteed success but we can certainly let's do the raw oops not blame um and give it a shot and thankfully we're in a position to try it again the vi okay that's good enough All right, we'll see if that compiles. Um, 
what do they call this one? Just dirty. Okay, so we need we need L crypt. No. Um is there no P thread? Bar lib. No. get a bunch of stuff from various packages user lib and we don't have a libp thread is there a lib32 no interesting maybe it's just slash lib there we go um, but we don't have p thread. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's copy this over here, I guess. We'll build it over here. Doesn't seem like it should work. I mean, I could statically compile it, I guess. Um, Wait, it said how to compile it, or is it just in the uh, in this one? Oh, oh, just dash p thread. Why is it not da okay? Whatever. Um, maybe p thread is different than most libraries. But I have a lib p thread here, so I don't. I'm not gonna worry about it. Don't have good shell stuff. Little crypt p thread um, dash o dirty and cook. Is it crypto? What? Dash o crypt. Maybe I need to put it last. Okay, apparently I needed to put it last. Alright, so it's going to try to do its thing. It's going to take a little while because it's a virtual machine, I guess. And it is, it doesn't have a lot of power. And it doesn't have anything in its code to try to check if it actually worked and quit out before doing the overwriting 2,002 million times or whatever. So. It's going to take a few minutes, I suppose, but we can fill in. Um, what do they want us to say? Oh, what is the verbatim? I'm just going to copy that then. It's not what did you literally type to do the thing. 
Uh, okay. I'm going to copy that original file and get it on the target box. You can do this with some simple file transfer methods like netcat or spinning up. Yeah, we just copied it into the text editor. Okay. Um, so run it and then what new username was created with the default operations of the C's, the real C source code. Firefart and okay, so let me just pseudo Grinch and all right. And we are group root and users UID zero. And what is that message? Nice work, Santa. Wow, this house sure was dirty. I think they deserve coal for Christmas, don't you? So let's leave some coal under the Christmas tree. Let's work together on this. Leave this text file here and leave the Christmas.sh script here too but create a file named coal in this directory. Then inside this directory, then inside this directory, pipe the output of the tree command into the md5 sum command. The output of that command, the hash itself, is the flag you can submit to complete this task for the admin of cyber. Okay, that's, um, thanks John. That's a, that's a weird way to get the flag. I'm curious if your video explains why you chose to do it that way. Um, so just uh, touch coal and then tree and do five sum and use that. And then we can sudo to that user and hey, that was it. Okay, cool. Um, so that was fun because it, I mean, I it's not that common to see rooms, especially in something this beginner oriented that make use of a kernel exploit there wasn't really anything we needed to do other than put the pieces of the existing exploit back together um but hopefully you know i mean certainly it got me reading the exploit code which i'm prone to do anyways but hopefully that was the case for other folks who are a bit newer with it as well um so that was an interesting special room. Uh, and I am definitely still curious about, <laughs> I'm gonna save John's video and watch it later, I think, uh, why the solution was the output of the tree command um, rather than just like have the flag written into a file um, that is only accessible once you get root access. I don't know. Uh, why is that not completed? Oh, I didn't hit that first one. Okay. Day 14, special room by the Cyber Mentor. Where's Rudolph? Twas the night before Christmas and Rudolph is lost. Now Santa must find him no matter the cost. You have been hired to bring Rudolph back. How are your OSN skills? Follow Rudolph's tracks. Task one, so this one's gonna be open source intelligence, fancy fancy Googling, uh, so to speak. So I like this. I like to I like to use Google from now now and again, you know. Put a little let's see if I can like I'll leave this open because I'm I think it would be interesting to try to write my own dirty cow exploit and make sure that I really get a full understanding of the the mechanism there I guess um, because I you know I, there's there's a level of understanding you get from reading somebody else's exploit code and there's a, probably another level that you get from trying to make it work yourself from scratch okay task one while hunting and searching for any hints or clues, Santa uncovers some details and shares the news. Rudolph loved to use Reddit and browsed aplenty. His username was I Guide the Claws 2020. 
Okay. Uh, many OSINT investigations start with only a username. A user's posting history can possibly lead to further information. Sometimes it's the smallest of clues that helps us out. Um, combine, or sorry, comb through Rudolph's Reddit history and answer questions number one through five below. You may need to use partial clues with a search engine to fill in the gaps. All right, the learning objectives are identify important information based on a user's posting history, utilize outside resources such as search engines to identify additional information such as full names and additional social media accounts. Cool. And additional resources. While Rudolph's posting history is enough for, I for us to identify that he has other social media accounts, sometimes we're not that lucky. Great tools exist that allow us to search for user accounts across social media platforms. Sites such as NameCheck, NameCHK, What's My Name app, NameCheckup.com will identify other possible accounts quickly for us. Tools such as Web Breacher, What's My Name, and Sherlock Project, or just Sherlock on GitHub, do this as well. Simply enter your username, hit search, and comb through the results. It's that easy. That's cool. I have not heard of or used any of these tools. My the extent of my OSINT is is basically uh, browser searches. So that that'll be handy if I. I mean, I'm basically don't ever actually do it outside of maybe the occasional CTF challenge um, because I, I don't know I'm not like trying to get docs on people usually um, but I guess if I'm in a position where that's handy then knowing about these tools is pretty good this one feels like the the you know potentially the most professional from a software developer standpoint just because of the way that the project the like organization is named and then the project name um but i bet the other ones are also quite useful for this stuff uh so yeah it looks through tons of um can i i don't have like Maybe there's a plugin I could get that would be able to pause this GIF, but uh, just sort of looking at the different sites that it uses. Okay. Um, so I guess we can go to reddit.com slash u slash I guide the clause. Clause 2020? Um, he commented on this tweet where somebody jokingly uh, talked about attacking somebody at Twitter and uh, the Twitter mods didn't take it very, very much like a joke. I feel like I get the guy's point of view. I assume guy, um, I should say, I get this person's point of view uh, about it being a joke. And I, I think in most cases people would read this and understand it as not uh, serious. But I think you're, in, you're, you're putting yourself in a harder position when the target of your, you know, fate, like uh, not, not serious mention of of beating somebody up is the person who would then be reviewing it to decide if it's ban worthy or not if they were you know like who do i got to beat up at such and such place that isn't twitter like maybe that would be seen a little more reasonably or a little more like everybody else might see it um than this would be so you know don't joke about the mods basically <laughs> they don't they don't take it the same way when they're the target of the joke um fun fact i was actually born in chicago and my creator's name was robert okay <laughs> that's um you know there you go uh and this person loves twitter i wonder if that means that they have a twitter account that's gonna be annoying for me i have to go back into my i uh, for productivity purposes I have uh, an override in my Etsy host file to make sure that Twitter doesn't load. <laughs> um, 
And so if I got to I got to do this on stream, I guess I'll have to turn that off. Cuz Let's do that now. Um Yeah, it's just, you know, it can be handy. Can I go to twitter.com? Is it load now? Okay. So if I go to twitter.com slash I guide the cause 2020, uh, that account doesn't exist. So, okay. So it's not quite that simple. Um, I was hoping the fact that they say they love Twitter is... Uh, you know, an, an indication that maybe they are on Twitter with the same account name. Um, unless I spelled it wrong. Technically, they had uh, a lowercase t, right? But I don't think that should matter. Okay. Yeah. And they were born in Chicago. Um, oh, yeah, I remember seeing this story. Um, yeah, basically if you don't have fines for overdue books, people will return their books because there's a little bit of a shame and there's a little bit of a like, uh, I don't want to pay whatever the fee has become for this. Um, so probably better in general, uh, to just not have fees like that in your... Your, you know, if you can get away with it uh, in your library. And started decorating for Christmas today. What's this image about? Wow, that's somebody enjoys Christmas. It's a very, like, I don't know, uh, magazine catalog Christmas. I guess not the section of plants over here, but all of this stuff feels very much like you you would see it in a like JC Penny catalog. Um cool. They like Christmas uh, clearly. Um okay. What is this one about? 20 ooh, wow. Oh, I kept reading this as display name, and I kept expecting their their Reddit username to be hidden in here somewhere. <laughs> but uh, no, it's just an incredibly impressive uh, set of, I mean, impressive in its, like, I excessiveness is how I would say it. Um, cool. This is the sort of house that if you're driving around looking for lights, you want to see one of these houses for sure. So, there you go. <laughs> um, yeah, holy electric bill sounds right. And then, okay, this is you know a very as they say cozy condo Christmas. Yeah, this is probably what you're gonna get if you are living in a small condo in. Hmm. Where would that be? I do wonder. Is that building top looks mildly familiar? Does that say Lowe's? PSFS? It is it is Philadelphia. Possibly. Um Oh no, that's Atlanta. Where I don't know why okay, maybe that's just like a relatively common style of doing the top of the building with this sort of inset section and then an overhang above it um this 
that's there. There's a Lowe's Atlanta. Okay. I guess it's a hotel chain. So with enough, you know, if you want to spend enough time, you could probably work out where this condo is. But that's not, that's not our task. That person is, I'm not, <laughs> D. Hamilton S. is not our target. Um, well, let's see if we can answer any of these questions. What URL will take me directly to their comment history? Is it this? That's too short, right? Yeah, I need like slash comments. There we go. I need to reload this page again. According to Rudolph, where was he born? Chicago. Rudolph mentions Robert. Can you use Google to tell me Robert's last name? Oh. And the creator's name was Robert. Okay. see if that helps don't want the walkthrough um, Yeah, I don't I don't know what else I should be pulling to find details of It's a three letter last name. Maybe maybe it's Elf, but I I mean, no. Okay. <laughs> um, is it a kind of like? Is there a generic bot that is being used for this account? I guess I wasn't looking at some of this other information. Um. I think they have any rewards? Okay. Um, I know I'm in the new version of Reddit, I guess. Okay. Hmm. What should I be thinking about? No, okay, hmm. Yeah, I don't know, unless it's mentioned in this article and it's weirdly like person. I don't know where I should be going from that. So let me maybe use, oh, there's no hint on that one. Um, Twitter. What is Rudolph's username? Hmm. Uh, maybe we need to use one of these sites.
There's like a maybe on Twitter, I guess. Gonna tell me what these names are? Invalid name. Oh, I see. They're gonna tell me. Uh, let's check. Oh, these are more like. Okay, let me try. What's my name? Because I think the other ones are really about finding accounts that already have that name. So if you're choosing a name, um, interesting, they have a Medium article. I had been thinking that the Medium stuff was... Um, can I see something about their Spotify? Do they have a Spotify playlist? Songs that they like? Do, 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 do. Um, yeah, something like name check, I think. is like looking to see if this name is available basically if you want to go on these other on these various sites um, yeah but this one is coming up with nothing even though there is technically an account there i guess the username is too long interesting on, on twitter okay um Maybe just I guide the claws. There is such an account. No. Oh, I turned off my thing again. Hey, Fernicaro, how's it going, man? Need to go back <laughs> to allowing me to use Twitter. Okay. Um, somebody did make this account. I don't know if they made I guess I didn't make it because it has a question like it's not I think it was made by the person creating this even though it was made in December no oh sorry just I guide the clause oh it's not interesting okay um, So it's probably based on finding oops, um, their last name for Robert, maybe. Um, supposed to be able to get questions one through five from the Reddit history. Where did I switch to Reddit? Okay. Um, it's not in here? Okay. Here we go. There's not, there's obviously not a lot, which is, you know, so be it. Um, which reminds me of home. I sure do miss it. Holy Electric Bill, Batman. All that's missing is some jingle juice. Who else is born in Chicago? Okay, yeah, obviously, you know. <laughs> 
or replying as the challenge is out there. Um, hmm. This one is definitely got me kind of stumped. I don't know. Obviously, my OSN skills are not particularly good. Um, so this one is this one is a real challenge. Uh, we can use Sherlock. I just it's gonna be just looking for the same user username on all these different services, and I feel like it's already there on these services. So this is this is one that was created by somebody who did the challenge, basically. Because um, they joined in December. All this other stuff was created in November. That seems plausible. Um, it's not Criminal Minds, right? There'd be a space in there. It's just them. It's just somebody else messing with us. So I don't know where to go. Okay. <laughs> I thought that was an extreme long shot. <laughs> but they just say fun fact. And maybe it's a fact about Robert Fun <laughs> rather than just the, the very common phrasing fun fact. Um, yeah, I mean, the Chicago and Robert are, is, is not going to be enough for me to pinpoint a last name. Um, so that's. Did I do I guy in the I think I did search for this all on its own. Right. There is an I guy the clause 2020. Oh, this must have been okay. Cause I tried to go to this before. Oh, it's I guide clause 2020. So that's why I didn't show up in those name ones because the, the was, I should have thought about that was another piece that like removing the 2020 is one way to go. Removing the, the, and then third, maybe removing I, but those are like all the other words are so essential to the uniqueness of this name that it would be, it would be difficult to make the leap to jump to, to make the leap to remove one of those. If you say like, I the clause 2020, that's a very different meaning than I guide the clause, right? But take out the makes sense. So business inquiries to Rudolph the red. So I'm assuming red is the last name. Um, I think we saw this and somehow I thought this was, we had seen the Twitter, it's not red. Okay, interesting. Um, I guess that was too easy. Uh, yeah, so I, I don't know why I didn't click on this before. Guy likes Musk and uh, Tesla. Uh, Bachelorette is the show. Oops, sorry. This is the one. I guide clause 2020. And you still gotta find that last name. Um, so maybe it's in here somewhere. Uh, what? <laughs> what? Uh, finger guy in the bachelorette? I don't, I don't understand the memes right now. I have not watched The Bachelorette in quite a long time. Of 
cool. Good work, Santa. You're 100%, although you used the Caro, I think, rather than... Yeah. Um, always thinking about my creator. Well, let's see if they follow their creator. <sighs> Gotta log into Twitter now. I've made serious strides in not looking at Twitter most of the day, you know? <laughs> now. I guess if I end up in a situation where I need to do a lot of OSINT, I can make a special account for uh, just for that. And then um, hmm. that is interesting. So, when they're following the Cyber Mentor, but they also say their creator's name is Robert. And the Cyber name Mentor, I don't think he is lying when he says his name is Heath Adams. So, the, in the fiction of this thing, um, Robert, you know, the Cyber Mentor is not the creator. But they're not following an account that represents the creator. So that's interesting. And then Yeah, what would be the last name of this Robert guy? Maybe it, this is more of a like, what is the fiction of Rudolph? <laughs> Let's see if I can just do, do reindeer. Rudolph wants, oh, okay. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> this is just about who created Rudolph the story uh i didn't didn't ever occur to me to think about rudolph um okay so based on rudolph's post history uh he took part in a parade where did the parade take place so he does talk about that in here um Maybe we can Thompson Coburn Coburn LLP LLP. So a law firm that is sponsoring. Oh, well, that's a pretty big law firm. <laughs> I was like, maybe you know, they're they're a local law firm that's sponsoring a, a Christmas parade, but these folks. Uh, are, are doing good in their <laughs> in their law firm practice and have a number of locations um i mean we could say chicago okay it felt kind of like is it really going to be the same answer in twice of them um but you know so be it uh okay so now we need to saying okay you found the city but where specifically was one of the photos taken this is looking like a uh, GPS coordinate a latitude longitude coordinate rather so they posted this higher resolution version somewhere where was that 
I saw it earlier. Oh, I see. They posted it here. I think they posted it here because possibly um let's see. Can I just save it and use file? Doomlands projects. Uh what am I looking for? Try hack me. Um not that. Okay, fourteen. I think it is. Day 14. Okay, so let's see if we can just run file on it. And if it will tell us that information. Oh, give us the flag. That's cool. Um, but I'm, I'm guessing we want. Give us a flag. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see. Let's see if this is, so file isn't going to tell us the coordinates, but maybe I can uh, open it up in one of these other programs. I don't have a lot of like photo editing programs installed, so we'll see if this one that I do have manages to have the to present the exif data um it's also possible that yeah let's see um it does not all right let's do let's see if there's just a program i can install um let's try this exit two Just want to say print day 14. Okay, so it's not listing the location information. So it's possible that it's in there, but it doesn't list it in that. Um, or it's possible that it needs to be one of those other images. So let's see. comment that says hi um, yeah doesn't okay print a summary PA okay I guess I need to put it first. 
Um, okay, there we go. This actually does show us all of that. So can we say E and then it gives us uh, <laughs> actually a, a more annoying representation. Um, what does this do for us? Okay. I'm trying to see if I can get a nice V maybe. All right. Um, so it wants it in not degrees, basically, or not like uh, I don't even know what these are called after the degrees. It wants a three-digit number here. No, that says eighty-seven degrees. I don't think this is going to work, but you know, it's worth a shot, I guess. So we'll be able to translate that. Um, here we go. I want this. So north forty seven, no, forty one, fifty three, and thirty one. And then west, 87, 37, and 27. Oh, I see negative 87. Okay, cool. Uh, so how many digits do we want here? We want seven digits. One, two, three four, five, six digits. We've got, so there we go, okay. And I'm assuming also six digits here. Yep. Probably wanna change that to a seven. Maybe we keep it as a six. Hmm, okay. Am I... It is six digits, right? Is there no space there? Right there is a space. Um, oops, put it in the wrong spot, but I don't think that's going to matter. So maybe that's not the photo with the address that we want to use. Hmm. All right, well, let's get one of those other photos. Day 14, we'll see if this one has EXIF data. Did we not just save it there? 
We have two day 14s. So why? So we didn't do it. Did it remove all the. Okay, so there's no exif data on that one. Um, so I feel like this is how we should be entering it. But I'm somehow getting the wrong conversion of these numbers, or it's like slightly off from what they want. This obviously wouldn't be an issue uh, in the real world, it's my guess. Just because, you know, if I'm like a few ten thousandths off or something in, an, in a location, yeah, see, it's like slightly different. 891, 815. 891, Maybe the EXIF data that I was being presented in. Oh, see, they were rounding it. So we got 5331, right? Rather, and 3727. So, yeah. Okay, so this is a better tool to use for this purpose. Um, but, you know, that's. It wouldn't have made a difference uh, in the real world. Because it's just so, like, I, I feel relatively confident if we go to this address. versus the one from here. We'll round it. Fucking right there versus right there, right? Like, only in extremely unusual circumstances would the fact that you're in the middle of the street versus close to the sidewalk really be making a difference. Um, so, I mean, maybe, you know, if it's like there was a crowd of people at that moment uh, in this space and you were trying to identify one person versus another person, then you want as accurate a possible GPS reading. Um, but they're only po like accurate to a meter or two or something. It depends on I think your device um, that's being what it's using. So, in any case, has Rudolph been pwned? What password of his appeared in a breach? Okay, so now we want to. Oh, we've gone past a bunch of stuff. Task number two. Well, it looks like you have uncovered Rudolph's. Well, it looks like you have uncovered Rudolph's Twitter. Now we can read into all of his chitter. Go through his profile and give it some views. The deeper you dig, the better the clues. All right, so this one covers like looking into at least the EXIF stuff, and then they suggest you sing Have I Been Pwned. Um, yeah, I think I remember reading some Twitter beef, a little bit of Twitter beef between uh, this gentleman who um, I've worked with in the past and uh and the person that runs this um and they're they're feeling around the selling of access to some stuff in this database i guess so let's see um we want to, yeah, like Troy Hunt runs this one, and I guess has tried to monetize it in ways that the gentleman known as Hyperion Gray does not uh, appreciate. 
or the, I guess, I I know one of the people from this company. <laughs> I guess that's what I should say. Um, not necessarily the any particular person that works on Sila. Um, I don't think I've talked to them about it, so I don't know if they work on it. Okay. Uh, we just put in I guide the clause twenty twenty. Do a search. Is it going to search? Is it actually? Not doing any kind of search. Um, so I don't know what I'm missing here. Um, okay, so I need to do like username. I think we can just put in an asterisk here. But we're not I'm not getting any results from that. So let's just go ahead and do it there. Um, get nothing for that. Okay. Um, is username a valid field? Oh, and here it just says D. Okay. Or it just says user, rather. Or no, sorry, it just is name. Still nothing. Um... Gotta wait a few seconds. We just do Klaus. That should come back with stuff, right? Okay. Um there is a guide. Does not come back with anything. Okay. Uh, oh, because they had their email address at the top. So let's throw that in. Yeah, something has. Okay. And it has their password. That's fun. Um, but I guess, you know, that is the nature of the thing. Uh, spy game? Was it? Okay. Based on all the information gathered, it's likely that Rudolph is in the Windy City and is staying at a hotel on Magnificent Mile. What are the street numbers of the hotel address? Interesting. Um, Marriott. Okay. So let's... We closed one of these guys. Okay. Um, is this the magic mile? That's sort of a gen like a not generic name, but like a a nickname that is presented, not the real name of the street. So I don't know. I've never been to Chicago. Um, mm, Oh, sorry, Magnificent Mile. It is North Michigan. Okay. Um, which is this street? Okay, so Chicago Marriott is 540. 
cool. Um, yeah, I like this one. It it definitely required me to put more effort into OS in stuff than I have done before. The these didn't end up being that helpful because they were just they they could only realistically search for exactly the same name, um, whereas. Google was able to connect up this account because they use this as their, even though this is not the account name, it's just iGuideClause 2020, their presented name or whatever, like this is the handle, I guess, and this is the profile name. I don't remember what terms Twitter uses, but right, Google is scraping these pages, it's crawling these pages and, and uh, ingesting the data into their search engine. So when we search for the thing that pings on this, it does find us the account. Um, so that ended up being the key for the, the piece that I was struggling with earlier. Uh, but I imagine, I mean, just from seeing the results of like, these would be pretty handy to very quickly go through and bulk search for the same exact account name. And then you could probably, you know, do your own, create basically a word list of similar ish names uh, and do so and, and at the same time maybe Google is going to scrape these sites anyways and, and you you know I would start with Google and then if it doesn't find stuff maybe switch to those um, XF data stuff you know I've definitely made use of that before uh, they talk about doing reverse image searches that's always a good idea um, I haven't used TinEye in a very long time uh Google Google is pretty good but it's got some if you if you have the exact same image then it works perfectly for what you want because you can find tons of sites that have that exact same image or scaled down or up versions of that image um but if it's like cropped in some way that they don't or otherwise modified in some way that they don't necessarily um detect as being the exact same image then you are just you've got this like find similar images thing maybe that's the part that i've found is like sometimes not as not what i would like because you like you want to find an image that's similar in some way that you can identify but Google's AI picks out one aspect of that image. It has a classifier and that classifier comes up with a sequence of a you know like a set of different things that it seems to have identified in a in a, like a percentage sort of uh confidence that it has and then usually the way the classifier algorithm works is you just pick the one thing that has the highest confidence because if you take a photo of something there's necessarily going to be multiple identifiable objects within the you know the the photo itself right maybe you take a photo of your cat but you've also got a couch in the background and you've got a carpet and something right and like the way the ai gets trained and all of that it's going to basically pick cat and then it's going to you know, if you search for similar images, you'll just get images of cats, not necessarily. And there's no way to necessarily say like, oh, actually, I wanted images of a similar couch to this, I think. Um, or maybe there's a more advanced way to use Google Images that I don't know about. But if you have the exact image and you're looking for anybody who's used that exact image scaled down or up, and you know, modified in very programmatic ways, um, it's very good for that. I haven't considered using any of these other sites in a long time i guess bing might be interesting you know like tin i i'm curious if it's still worth doing just because i feel like the the quality of the reverse image search results is so heavily dependent on access to vast amounts of data that i am curious if a company like tin i is able to really keep up with uh, Google and Microsoft in that regard. And I, I don't know, Yandex, I mean, they're, you know, as close as you're going to get to a Google in Russia. So it's possible <laughs> that they are, they're in the same league, but I don't know. Um, you know, maybe a lot of this is like, uh, 
is a more curated kind of experience. Like I, I do wonder if these are AI based, based results and they have an AI that can recognize hot chocolate with marshmallows or if it's pages that mention strictly pages that mention these terms. Cause there is like, obviously that feeds into Google's results as well. Um, if it's on a page that mentions the terms in your search, but that's, this is a forward image search, right? So you don't necessarily have that luxury. Um, so like, let's say we get this image. Can I just get that URL and then we go, let me do this image search. Is it going to find me a bunch of hot chocolate or is it going to find me that image? Right. So, okay. It does the, the, like the most, you know, a sense, uh, most sensible thing, which is, um, find me images that are exactly the same. And then it looks like I'm not, I can't read the Russian, so I don't know, but, um, it's possible that this, this image, you know, they, they, can associate it with the terms that are in the pages that include it and then find, oh, here's, a, you know, the most likely terms that are associated to this image. And from there, do another forward image search that is for one of these terms or multiple of these terms or something. Um, but maybe they're doing an AI based classif classification as well. I don't know. It seems like it's, you know, if you wanted images of marshmallows and, and hot chocolate, you're, you're good to go, especially if you wanted stock photo style images of that. <laughs> there seem to be uh, quite a few out there. Okay. And, you know, but it, it never hurts to use all of the resources, I suppose. And then, yeah, we looked at EXIF data. Um and then breach information we looked at a little bit at the end so that was i like this challenge just because it was definitely stuff that i am not as familiar with haven't really spent as much time with okay wrapping up it looks like finding rudolph was a bit too easy his opsec would make any security pro queasy to the windy city rudolph was tracked christmas is saved we brought rudolph back cool i'm glad we found rudolph um yeah and then you know you can follow the cyber mentor and and maybe sign up for his academy courses if you're interested in doing more extensive OSINT training i guess in practice i think i feel like trying one of these to see where it goes um it looks like we'll do some python and then yeah we'll see how long this takes Day 15, scripting. There's a Python in my stocking, which is created by B. And I can look at their Twitter profile because I still have Twitter working on this computer. And cool. You seem like a cool person to follow. There we go. All right. Have you ever wondered how the elves managed to keep up with building toys for so many people all around the world? Do you ever get sad and think, huh, with 7 billion people in the world and growing, that means that each elf will be working nonstop to build toys. They'll never get a break. Well, I have good news for you. Thanks to the magic of Santa, elves have machines that can build toys for them. This machine requires an elf to design a toy and then describe how to make the toy in a scripting language. Scripting languages are special types of programming languages well-suited for smaller, shorter programs, such as the designs of a toy. This document is for any elves looking to work with Santa. Once you have completed this, you'll be able to easily manufacture toys and use Santa's APIs. So, like, first off, <laughs> you know, the idea that, like, okay, this all works because the elves have machines powered by Santa's scripting language innovations. It's such a like industrial 
revolution and or you know post industrial revolution certainly digital kind of like modern conception of how um fantasy things work <laughs> you could just say it's all magic but these days our magic you know somehow we want it to be underpinned by machinery because that's how we understand the world at this point um and i think that's interesting and then uh i mean scripting languages it's not wrong necessarily to say that scripting languages are well suited for smaller shorter programs i think that is as close of a good definition as you can get to what might be subjectively considered a scripting language or not but yeah like the fact that we're going into python i wouldn't call python a scripting language because it it's also well suited for larger programs and, and you know well structured software development uh it just happens to have enough flexibility to be used in a sort of scripting context so i don't know it's probably a fine way to present it without without going into the territory of saying like scripting languages are somehow less than real programming languages or whatever because you get that opinion a lot from some folks and it's it's not very helpful um and i don't think it's very bit it's it's a it's not based in any real uh evidential understanding of of how these things work or how they're used uh okay so we have a little tutorial on python i'm not going to go through the tutorial uh what is the output of true plus true that is interesting is it two yeah because it's gonna transparently convert them into integers that's that shouldn't that's one of those areas that python shouldn't do that's more of a javascript thing <laughs> in my opinion to have to be that loose with your uh type distinctions the the sort of like optimistic conversion of types um it doesn't happen it you know it's not like python does that to the extent that javascript does so i'm very surprised that that uh, expression is valid What's the database for installing other people's libraries called? Is that PyPI? Yeah. What is the output of bool false? Is it just false? No. Is it true? Because the string, oh yeah, yeah. Because it's not, it's not gonna interpret, it's not parsing the string. Um, it's just it's a it's is this a truthy value or not and i think maybe empty string is going to be falsy yeah but anything here is going to be true so okay that makes sense what library lets us download the html of a web page uh lot, lots of them requests okay that's the one to use i'd say what is the output of the program provided in code to analyze for question five in today's material? Um, okay. Sorry, it says the code is located above the Christmas banner and below the links in the main body of this task. Oh, just right here. Okay. So we get a list of one, two, three. Y is equal to that list. Y dot append. So... Yeah, it's one, two, three, six. Because I mean that's that is a key thing to learn. Um, it feels like this is a difficult task to like try to explain enough about Python to to make it usable, and then also still have to like kind of present this idea of references without probably being able to get into the why and the and the the details of it but at the same time like you're probably going to get tripped up by it so we gotta show it <laughs> to a certain degree and like like maybe they don't explain it but hopefully you glean something from being able to understand this code and why the answer is this um because this is this is definitely like when i taught ruby this was a key concept that we had to get across at some point relatively early on 
Otherwise, you're just going to get tripped up by it in code that you write or code that you're trying to understand. Um, and in my opinion, like it's probably one of the reasons why it's better to have an introductory programming uh, curriculum that it uses a language that doesn't support this kind of thing implicitly. Um, so, you know, a more functional style language, um, something with that maybe emphasizes immutable data or just defaults to immutable data at least. Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of Lisp based languages for learning because I think they cut out a lot of complications and you can introduce those complications later once the fundamentals are better understood. But that's a whole different topic. Um, okay, what caused the previous task to output that? Um, and we say value versus reference. Oops. No. Um, what? What is it they call it? Pass by reference. Okay. Uh, sure. I mean, there's no. There's no like. Well, I guess you are passing Y to append as the self argument. So, okay, we'll set that aside. But the fact that it's it's really about the fact that Y is a reference to the same thing that X is a reference to. Um, okay. Can we get this also? Day 16, scripting. Help, where is Santa? Also created by B. Oh no, Santa has taken off, leaving you, the faithful elves, behind. Can you help find Santa's location? Luckily, the elves are OS int masters and remember a thing or two. Specifically, they remember Santa has a web page at, gotta deploy the machine, uh, whatever that IP is, slash static, slash index.html, to help lost elves find their way home. Santa never told the elves what port number the web server is on. Can you find out? This web page has a link somewhere on it, hidden away, so anyone that isn't an elf can't find it. Uh, okay. And Santa's sled has an API we can talk to. The key for the API is between 0 and 100, and it's an odd number. But be careful. After an unknown number of attempts, Santa's sled will ban your IP address. <laughs> cool. Deploy the machine that is running Santa's sled and allow for a couple and allow a couple of minutes for the target to start up. Using a Python skills from day 15, find the correct key for the API. All right, so we know it's a four-digit port number. I mean, just you know, that's a little bit cheating to be able to glean that from the the answer key here. But um, yeah, I mean, I you know going to run nmap on it and and hope that it's in one of the top 1,000 ports, let's say, because I, I don't want to be waiting a long time to scan the whole range. But if we have to, then we have to. Um, I guess I'd only be scanning, just to save myself time, the range from uh, 1,000 to 9,999. But, you know, Worst case scenario, you scan the whole port range and you just allow for the time for that. All right. So nmap. Okay. Yeah, let's just do that. Eight thousand sounds likely. There we go. Okay. I'm gonna go with slash API. Yeah, that's pretty common. It says it has a link somewhere in here. JavaScript.
Not found. Interesting. I guess that's why it's grayed out. Um, all right, I'm not going to search through all of that, I think. Oh, I do have to find the link on this page. Is it sort of randomly? Um, can I just do it? say a tags? I do it in JavaScript. <laughs> uh, Okay. There we go. Didn't even need to use. I don't know what you use these days uh, in Python for it, but what I used back in my day was. Okay, so you need to hit this. And find an odd numbered uh, thing. So we do like 49. Key's not valid. Okay. Um, I would use something like stone soup, I guess. Um, so yeah, if you get blocked, you really just do have to kill it and re redeploy. Uh, that's great. Okay. Uh, there's a CGI bin. Oh, sorry, that's their link to for Nmap. Um, this is this is just the page. I didn't understand this for some reason. HTTP one point one slash 1.1 space 200 okay date blah 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 I don't know why it didn't uh, understand that result <laughs> um, but there there you go so uh, what was I saying oh I would use something like stone soup uh, to work with the XML but there's probably like something more modern these days um, can I just do it in JavaScript? Now I'm like, uh, I think I can do like there's a constructor. I don't want object constructor, I want array constructor. Like, is it not like a normal object then? Here we go. Ray. Where's that in the list here? Whatever. Um, so I think I can say something like, Uh, 
Well, now I'm like half writing Python. Uh, no. Or do I need uh, parens around it? Probably. I need not know how to do. Hmm. Is it four space each? Or is that... Okay, so I guess I could do ray two dot four each. Doesn't really matter. Um, is that not? Why am I not seeing is that because the array created doesn't loop over those things? Oh, I said I need to say new array, I guess. I keep switching to the wrong window. Um, no? That's annoying. Um, okay, so four in. This is the non deprecated one, I think. Okay, four of. That's what I want, I guess. I can never remember which of these I want. Um, keep strong. Okay, so throw it in and we'll do forty nine. Let's do like one, and we'll say const URL equals. n times 2 plus 1 oh I don't uh, yeah I just want a regular for loop I guess there's no I don't know what I was thinking um, let n equals 0 for n can I say for let n equals 0 n plus plus and we're gonna do it that way. My JavaScript skills are truly amazing. All right, then we want to do a wait. Uh, what is the built-in? Quest. Fetch. There we go. Um, oh, keep switching. Okay. Yeah. So, whoop, nope. All right. the fetch function K 
Okay, apparently I'm on insert now. Const res equals await. Let's do that just to start with. Ugh. Um. I do it that way? Will that allow me to redefine it? Why can't I await the result of the fetch? We can't. I'm on the same. God damn it. <laughs> I guess I can't do it in the browser. All right. Um, import requests, I guess. So for i in x range let's do one for now um API. Uh, just like it. Docs. Get. Okay. Oh, it's not, yeah, because I stuck in my Python. Uh, is it read? Okay. What do we do with the, oh, text, I guess. We can do JSON, I guess. Because it is JSON. Okay, so. Python dictionary. I know what the API is. I guess I could say get and have false as the default. Um, Oh, 
Oh, right. You can just say, like, if q in j in res dot json. Just do it that way. In res if res q was the error that we got. Not valid. Say range one one hundred two, I think. So then we can do that and just is it like dollar Python? The new, yeah, let's just look at this. Oh, F strings, I guess. Okay. Use this real Python website. This seems a bit slow, but. Um, yeah, I know how the old stuff works. And it's just curly. Okay. This will false positive on, uh, a if we get locked out but i'm hoping that the lockout is less than uh or is more than like 55 or 60 or whatever we need 57 cool there we go okay so that's where All right, that was fine. Uh, I wasted my time trying to do it in, in JavaScript because I was like, I'm already in the browser. Why don't we just go for it there? But, you know, the Python code is uh, not exactly immensely complicated to do the equivalent. It's probably simpler because we're not dealing with the uh, asynchronous nature of JavaScript at all. So that's all of the advent of cyber challenges up through day 16. Um, from here on out, I'll, I don't know if I'll be streaming every day, but uh, you know, if I stream every other day, it's still just like two challenges to go through. So to the extent that I'm gonna be streaming um, going forward this month, I will probably be adding other stuff onto the streams, working on other projects, working on maybe the nightmare challenges again, working on some heap exploitation. Um, there's a cool thing, Pwn College, um, which seems great. It's by some some really experienced folks uh, at, I believe it's Arizona State University, Zardas. Um, I don't know Kanak really, but uh, this, this person is part of like shellfish, um, which I think is a combination of people from Arizona State and uh, San somewhere. 
one of the uh, one of those idyllic coastal towns in in Southern California um, that I'm not remembering right now. But they've uh, I think I know them mostly from like trying to learn about anger, which I have previous streams about, uh, and they they created that to work on the now like five six year old uh defcon challenge which was all about doing automated um vulnerability research stuff and so anger came out of that i think maybe manticore came out of that as well um but they they basically uh decided to teach their i guess it's over now um but they they taught their course online for the most part uh this year which you know makes sense with the whole situation um but they were really generous to live stream it all through twitch and they've uploaded all of it to youtube which is where i'll be looking at it because i, I haven't really been keeping up with the twitch streams uh including all of their office hours and stuff um and They've just they've got tons of these videos. Um, this might be like I don't know if they're still going on, but like there's a lot of great content for them from them entirely about pwn stuff basically. Um, and so I think I will probably watch through some of this stuff um until we get into some of the later sections where it's probably new content for me and then uh then maybe i'll stream that stuff um but they also in addition to just having the the lecture content they have where's the link to it practice problems so they have stuff that we can like you know basically war game challenges ctf challenges that we can play on stream and try to solve based on the information that's been learned in the from the class so i'll probably you know maybe i'll just watch this the lectures off stream and then try to talk about what i learned and then uh, apply some of that knowledge to some of these practice problems on stream and I'll just figure out where in here seems like the right place for me to start. Um, maybe ROP stuff. I mean, I've done ROP, but, you know, always more practice is helpful. I haven't really done much of anything in the kernel. I'm assuming this is Linux kernel. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's just a little bit of a different environment and, and ideally more constrained. Depends on how you, you know, what uh, security stuff you have you know if you're running the packs patches or whatever then obviously you're in a much harder position to exploit things within the kernel space but that's all for for later on um dynamic allocator misuse i guess this is this is all heap stuff right so at the very least heap stuff i haven't really done so i'll be you know wanting to practice and, and do that stuff on stream um and maybe i'll maybe i'll like focus towards this and tie in the nightmare challenges once i feel like i've gotten some practice with the stuff from the class because the nightmare challenges um while fun and and uh obviously very challenging it's not a learning resource really and so if it's my first time you know going at a particular thing uh it might not be the best place to start my practice in learning about that particular topic so it's like it might be better to do this stuff first and then switch over to the stuff on uh in nightmare challenges for additional you know sort of extra credit practice basically because i do think they these ones probably you know the challenge the practice challenges that they have here remain relatively um targeted towards what has been taught in there whereas the ctf challenges and the nightmare course really in my experience and the ones that i've done so far do you know move eventually get into a category of like okay here's a much more convoluted version of this uh exploit scenario and so it does seem like good extra credit kind of work 
Um, so, yeah, I want to get back into that stuff, and I hopefully uh, now that we're we're you know basically wrapped up on Advent of Cyber, except for maybe take half an hour uh, or an hour on each stream to do the latest ones. Um, we can we can get back to focusing on that stuff, which I know for the people that uh, have popped in and, and and worked you know talked with me on on in chat. Um, that's what they've said they're most interested in. So I will do what I can to to give them that content. And I mean that's definitely an interest of mine. So it aligns pretty well. All right, that's everything for this stream. Uh, been going for a while and now I'm just kind of rambling and it's like 3 a.m. So gonna, gonna close it out. Thank you all for watching and, uh, catch you on the next one.